The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. Where strange lights speed beyond reason across a clear night sky. The house at the end of the road, where disembodied voices whisper, and strange noises make the living shiver. Lurking shadows hiding on the edge of the woods, just outside your back door. Odd, true events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is where our minds wander. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And welcome to Where Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanderers. We hope you all enjoyed our last week's episode. We know it was a little long. And we kind of had to make it longer tonight, too, because the topic I'm covering is so big, I wanted to do it justice by covering as much of it as I could. And speaking of topics, we were so into the topic of mediums last week that we recorded a bonus episode for all of you. And you can find it in our premium content wherever you listen to us. And we'd appreciate it if you'd check it out. Yeah, now we set it at $3, and that's the lowest our hosting provider would allow us to set it. We would like to went a little bit lower, but at $3 for what it takes to put together, it's really not all that much. And like Beth said, if you're interested, check it out. And while you're checking that out, if you could leave us a five-star review and a comment on your favorite listening platform for our podcast, that would be great. We really appreciate the feedback, and it really helps more people find us so that we can move up the list some and continue to provide you with where our minds wander. So with all that said, let's see where Beth's mind wandered for this episode. Okay, so... There's the Bermuda Triangle, there's the Bennington Triangle, and then there's the Bridgewater Triangle. Take your pick. All three of the bees have had strange occurrences within their perimeters for years. But it's the Bridgewater Triangle that might win out for having the most variety of what many people would consider paranormal stuff. So that's my topic for tonight. Located in southeastern Massachusetts, the Triangle's three points are the towns of Freetown, Rehoboth, and Abington, with an area of about 200 square miles. Interestingly, Fall River, where Lizzie Borden lived, isn't that far outside the Triangle's area. What people claim to encounter there is, like I said, pretty varied. UFO sightings are common, most often in the form of balls of light although actual discernible craft are also reported. There are uncommon animal sightings, as in animals that don't live in the area are frequently spotted, like bears and panthers. But there are also reports of giant snakes, Bigfoot, Thunderbirds, and puck wedgies. Hauntings are common in the Triangle, too, from shadow people to poltergeists. Animal mutilations were tied to cult activity back in 1998, and there are even tales of Native American curses. So what you're saying is the Bridgewater Triangle pretty much has everything you could possibly want. If you're into the paranormal, absolutely. But when you consider the history of this area, it isn't hard to see why so many paranormal things seem to happen there. So to really understand the area, we have to go all the way back to 1665. A portion of the triangle is covered by the largest freshwater swamp in Massachusetts, spanning 17,000 acres, which the Wampanoag people named Hockamock, which means the place where spirits dwell. It was the early colonists who dubbed it the Devil's Swamp. During the late 1600s, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maine, and Connecticut were in the throes of the First Indian War, which was also known as King Philip's War. So to sum it up briefly, 
In Massachusetts, after the death of the Wampanoag chief Massasoit, his son became chief. His name was Metacomet, but he adopted the name Philip because his father was an ally to the Mayflower Pilgrims. But by the time Metacomet was in charge, the colonists had gone back on their word numerous times and continuously broke treaties. For their part, the angered native tribes across all four colonies often retaliated with raiding parties. The tensions escalated into an all-out war, and all in all, almost 5,000 people died, although that number may be way lower than the actual number. It's estimated that between 2,000 and 3,000 were killed in the native population, and 2,800 colonists were killed. But we know from history that numbers are often underreported. Most certainly so. Anyway, Metacomet was sequestered in a natural rock cave during his final days, in the woods of what is now Norton, Massachusetts. He was killed by one of his own men, and then later beheaded by colonists. It's in and around this cave, despite the housing development within walking distance, that people report strange goings-on. Most common are orbs of light that seem to dart in between trees. But then there's also many reports of phantom fires, campfires in the distance that disappear when curious hikers get too close. And we've heard about phantom fires before, like John White saw them on the coast of Roanoke. And when we were talking about the Marfa lights, too, originally they described them as campfires that would just disappear. That's right, they did. People often claim at King Philip's Cave that they often hear beating war drums as well. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. To begin with, there are several large boulders in the triangle that are shrouded in mystery. In Freetown, there is a 50-foot-high rock that looks eerily like a human face. The Wampanoag people considered it sacred and that it resembled Chief Massasoit. Known as Profile Rock, the area immediately around it has been the site of strange happenings for centuries. Hikers have claimed to hear faint, disembodied voices, almost like chanting, before coming across what looks like warriors dancing around the rock, only to have them vanish from sight. Others say the apparition of a man with outstretched arms sits on Profile Rock, again only to shimmer and vanish. And there are reports of strange orbs of light flitting around the rock face and then whizzing off between the trees. But still others are a mystery because of their strange inscriptions. One inscribed boulder was discovered in the riverbed of the Taunton River way back in 1680, and it might be the most famous of the enigmatic boulders. Known as Dighton Rock, it weighs about 40 tons. It's slightly slanted in shape and has six sides, and it's also the size of a small car at five feet high, nine and a half feet wide, and 11 feet long. So you might be wondering, what's so interesting about a big river rock? Well, it's covered in ancient petroglyphs that nobody can figure out. The first time anyone recorded what was on the Dighton Rock was back in 1680, when an English colonist named Reverend John Danforth made a drawing of the petroglyphs. And his drawing, if you wanted to see it, is in the British Museum today. In 1690, Cotton Mather described the petroglyphs in his book, The Wonderful Works of God Commemorated. The glyphs themselves are made up of lines, geometric shapes, humanoid figures, and writing. Theories on who made these ancient markings have been bounced around for centuries, including Native Americans, which makes sense since we know Native people live there. There's one glyph that's similar to another one that was found in eastern Vermont, but the rest of them aren't similar at all to any known Native glyphs. Other theories are that they are ancient Phoenician, Norse, Portuguese, or Chinese. But again, no one has been able to prove any direct correlations between the glyphs on Dighton Rock and any of those cultures. But that's not all when it comes to strange boulders in the triangle. 
in the middle of a pine forest in East Bridgewater, surrounded by trees and other rock outcroppings, another special boulder blends easily into the natural landscape. But when the sun hits it just right, a long carved inscription becomes visible. It says, I wish may here remain when yon brick shaft on leafy sprague overlooks no more the plain, and let the trees around it grow to stripe its sides with shade, as on the quiet August days when I these letters made. Hmm, makes it sound like it could be a grave marker. Almost. The poet who left the inscription on the unassuming rock also included the date, 1862, and it's believed that the message was carved by a reverend named Timothy Otis Payne. Now, Payne was well-educated in poetry, oriental languages, Freemasonry, and Egyptology. In fact, at one point, he was considered to be the leading Egyptologist in the entire United States. The letters on the rock are so perfectly and evenly spaced, it must have taken an incredible amount of time and skill to carve them. But the question everybody asks is, why? Why would he carve such a long verse into a boulder in the middle of the woods? Well, perhaps he thought someday people would come along it and it would be a mystery and it would make people think. Yeah. And the funny thing is, it's not the only one that he that he left. In West Bridgewater, there's a second one. It was found at the base of an old wooden bridge where it was hidden for nearly a hundred years. This one is harder to understand, though. It says, All ye who in future days walk by Nucketesset stream, love not him who hummed his lay, cheerful to the parting beam, but the beauty that he wooed in this quiet solitude. That's cool. It is, and I studied poetry for years, and I feel like I know quite a bit about it, but I even had to Google hummed his lay because <laughs> I could yeah. not figure out what that was supposed well, to mean. <laughs> maybe it's about frolicking in the woods with your loved one. He was and... a reverend, though. <laughs> but because of the last two words of the poem, the stone has been nicknamed the Solitude Stone. And nobody knows why he carved it. So there are at least four interesting, if not downright mysterious, rocks in the Bridgewater Triangle. And for history buffs like me, who also like a bit of mystery, it's enough for me to think a place is pretty cool. Like, I would go to the area just to see those rocks. Oh, yeah, exactly. I'm kind of a dork it that would... I would go there to see rocks, but I well, would. Well, it's, it's strange to see an inscribed rock out in the middle of nowhere. Right. But those rocks are just a teeny tiny part of the weird things that go on in the Bridgewater Triangle, because they also have more than their fair share of cryptids. So to start off, people have claimed to encounter giant snakes and red-eyed dogs in the Triangle. But as I'd mentioned earlier, there's also bizarre reportings of actual known animals being spotted in the Triangle that don't belong there, like panthers. So that's rather odd. Animals that don't belong there. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, and people are seeing them all the time. So two boys in 1988 didn't see a panther or a giant snake or a red-eyed dog. But remember, all of the Bridgewater Triangle area was once home to the Wampanoag tribe. And several of the cryptids witnesses have seen seem to fit in with the Wampanoag legends. So while walking through the swamp, the two boys came across a pair of giant three-toed footprints. And when they looked up, they saw a massive creature. It was as tall as a man with human-like features, but it also had massive wings. That's when it's time to run. They did, but not quite yet. The creature, which they thought had to be an incredibly huge bird, and it just took off like it was standing and then it was in midair. And that's when the boys took off running. They went right home and they told their parents about it. And then they started telling other people about it. And of course, they were laughed at because pretty much everyone said, well, it's just a great blue heron. And the boys kept insisting that it definitely was not a great blue heron. 
But then people began to recall another story, this time by a police officer, Sergeant Thomas Downey, from back in 1971. Downey actually filed a report about what he had seen. He said he was driving home along Winter Street in Marshfield when he suddenly saw a huge creature standing by the swamp. He said in his report that it looked like a bird, but it stood over six feet tall. He said it resembled a massive black pterodactyl. When other officers arrived at the scene, they too found those strange three-toed footprints. The giant bird man, because witnesses have said it appears to have man-like features as well as a 12-foot wingspan, could possibly be a thunderbird. I I find the whole bird-like thing creepy as all hell. Really? You know? Oh, yeah. I, I don't like birds. Other than owls or ducks, I don't care for birds. In Native American legend, thunderbirds are so massive that they are said to create a sound like thunder when they beat their wings and lightning shoots from their eyes. So you probably wouldn't like them very much either. No, not at all. They've been known to attack humans when they're angered. And the Wampanoag tribe did have their own Thunderbird myths and beliefs. So it's interesting to me that witnesses have been spotting what could possibly be one for like 50 or 60 years. Oh, that's possible. Thunderbirds aren't the only Native American-based cryptid potentially living in the Bridgewater Triangle, because witnesses have also claimed to have encounters with Puckwudgies. <laughs> Puckwudgies. <laughs> That is the most fun to say. <laughs> that reminds me like puck wedgies. <laughs> it's like little things have, you know, their underwear going up their butts. And I could see them constantly like, you know, stopping to like pull it out. I don't think they wear underwear. <laughs> they don't sound like they could physically wear it once I tell you what they look like. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the triangle doesn't just include the Hockamock Swamp. It also contains the 5,441-acre Freetown State Forest. And Puckwudgies are not as cute as they sound. They're prevalent in Wampanoag legend as well, and they're said to be a race of troll-like creatures. They stand three to four feet tall and have hairy gray skin and large ears. They kind of look like a cross between a porcupine on two feet and a gremlin from the Gremlins movies. Ooh. Yeah, they're not cute. I guess not. They're known for causing mischief and can appear and disappear at will. They can create fire and shoot poison arrows and attack with short knives and spears. Or they throw sand at you to blind you. So not, not pleasant no, little no. things. And they also like to lure humans to their deaths by pushing them off of cliffs. Oh, they're little bastards. And they... <laughs> I don't like puckwudgies. <laughs> Legends abound about the puckwudgies, including the former site of an 18th century sawmill that once stood in Easton, Massachusetts. The mill was owned by John Salee, and the historic marker there states that his son Nathan was a wizard who ran the mill all night long by using satanic imps he had conjured. And those imps were puckwudgies. She could have made something a little bit cuter to keep you company. <laughs> I just love that it's on a historic marker. Like, can you imagine driving by a historic marker that says that, you know, the person who lived here was a wizard? <laughs> I, that's different. I think I would have been conjuring something like, you know, fairies. Kind of like Tinkerbell. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> no. Okay, back to puckwudgies. So you might be inclined to think that they're just a myth, but they've actually been encountered in the triangle by some pretty credible, more modern-day witnesses. One man named Bill Russo told a pretty chilling tale about his encounter with what he thought was a puckwudgie about 30 years ago. He said he was walking his dog in the town of Raynham, after his midnight shift at the Raynham Ironworks. His dog, which was a Rottweiler German Shepherd mix, suddenly began, quote, 
shaking like a washing machine. He immediately started to hear a strange chant that sounded like Kier, Kier, Ewan, Chu. Bill didn't see anything at first, but then, under the glow of a street lamp, he could make out what he thought was a child in a Halloween costume. The child was only three or four feet tall and had an almost teddy bear appearance with a pot belly. But then he realized it couldn't be a child in a costume because it wasn't wearing a mask and its eyes were too big for its head. Oh, and that's kind of chilling. Yeah, and then it started motioning to him with its arm or paw to come closer. Samantha, his Rottweiler German Shepherd, was struggling to get away from the creature, so Bill turned and just went home. And it was only later that it dawned on him that the strange creature might have been saying, Come here, we want you. Well, that certainly could have been what it was saying. I mean, it sounds pretty close to that. Kier, kier, we want you. But you see this pot belly little bear looking thing and you just like turn with your dog and. If I was go walking home, a... I'd be running like hell. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something. I thought you were going to say the opposite that you would have checked it out, that you would have gotten closer. <laughs> no, not with something like that. So to sum it up so far, we've got strange rocks. We've got ghostly apparitions by some of them, we've got possible thunderbirds, and we've got puckwudgies. But that's not it. There's more. In the 1970s, residents near the Hockamock Swamp started seeing a seven-foot-tall hairy creature running through their backyards. A woman in West Bridgewater looked out her window one day to see this hairy bipedal creature eating a pumpkin right in her garden. Convinced it was nothing more than a bear, police officers began staking out the area. On April 8, 1970, two officers in a cruiser were parked near the swamp. The back end of their car was just suddenly lifted up into the air and then let go so that it just crashed into the ground. The officers spun around as quickly as they could just in time to catch sight of a very large, very hairy, bipedal creature running away in their headlights. Oh, I think this is going to be about my favorite cryptid. <laughs> in July of 1979, an official report came in from Plymouth County by a witness who said that for three nights in a row, between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., they heard god-awful screaming coming from the woods behind their house. It didn't sound like any sort of animal that they knew, and it did not sound human. And they could also hear branches snapping and what sounded like something very, very large coming closer to their house. They were too scared to investigate, but they called it in as a Bigfoot encounter. There we go. There have been more recent Bigfoot reports, and one of them that I looked at from 2009 was pretty compelling. In it, the person making the report said a federal agent was also present at the time of this incident. So it was January and snow was covering their backyard. And they had a bunch of family over at the house and a child went outside to play and came back in saying that there were massive footprints in the yard. So the adults went out and followed these tracks, and they seemed to lead from trash can to trash can across several neighboring yards. So I looked at the photos that the witness included with the report, and they're just, they're without a doubt, the perfect Bigfoot footprint in the snow. Like, they're incredible. They're remarkable. And the man who took the picture stood with his foot next to it. He was wearing boots. So you could see that this print was like twice the size of his boot. Wow. Most compelling photographs I've ever seen of, of Bigfoot prints. But where there's Bigfoot sightings, what else is there? Oh, there's always UFO sightings also. UFO sightings. And of course, the Bridgewater Triangle has those too. It has everything. It has 
everything. It's too bad they have those puck wedgies, though. <laughs> Am I going to hear you just wandering around the house, just mumbling, puck wedgie, puck well, wedgie? <laughs> I'd rather have the pot belly bear version thing, yeah, than a puck wedgie. Yeah. So the UFO sightings in the Bridgewater Triangle go as far back as 1760. But in 1908, sightings made the local newspapers. And then in the 60s, the sightings really took off. Over the span of two hours, one night in 1966, three separate groups of witnesses spotted objects in the sky glowing with different colored lights. One group said an object with amber glowing lights passed over their car before just shooting off into the sky. At the same time, another group of people in a car said they saw an oval object with red and orange lights hovering over the road, and it took off with incredible speed when a car came from the other direction. At the same time, a third group claimed the object was covered in red flashing lights, and they could hear a high-pitched whistling sound as it hovered over them. The reports of strange lights and unidentified flying objects span all across the 1960s and then crop up again in the late 90s like a cluster of sightings. But one of the more interesting and more recent reports I found, and all the ones I'm talking about came from MUFON, by the way, the most recent one that I found happened in November of 2015. So the witness and their brother were on Route 24 passing the Taunton Mall exit when they both spotted a single bright light hovering over the highway in the northwest. The light didn't move, even as they got closer to it, which, to me, would make me think that it's a planet. Yeah, exactly. But then a second light suddenly appeared, and the second one was pulsating. So after a few seconds of this second light appearing and pulsating over and over, the first one just blinked off like it was turned off by a switch. They tried to keep their eyes on the second pulsing light, but they lost it in the tree line. So I was thinking if it was a planet and a star, I don't know why MUFON would investigate it. And they did. Well, they would investigate anything for a strange report that came in that seemed kind of credible, I guess. I would think the people that reported it would have known... I don't know. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. It is interesting. So back to where I started with hauntings. Profile Rock is just one place where spirits seem to dwell in the Bridgewater Triangle. Watch any ghost hunting show and they inevitably visit a home or a business or a cemetery within the 200 mile area because ghosts are pretty much everywhere there. Well, yeah, Kinder Spirits, their Friday night episode was in the Bridgewater Triangle. I know. I was like hitting you as we were watching. I was like, look, look, it's the triangle. Yeah. They didn't say too much about it other than mentioning that, that it, was it was in, in the, the triangle. Yeah. So the hauntings there run the gamut, too, from what could be urban legend to actual poltergeists. On the urban legend end... It starts on Route 44 between Seekonk and Rehoboth. Drivers will be tooling along when they come across a lone man walking down the road. He's wearing a red flannel shirt, dirty jeans, and boots. But the most distinguishing feature is his long red hair and bushy red beard. Sometimes he puts his thumb out for a ride, but other times he doesn't. Either way, you don't want to stop for the red-headed hitchhiker. Because those who have say he will get into the back seat without a word. And if you ask where he's headed, he will just point straight ahead silently. That's why you don't pick up hitchhikers. It gets worse. Because quietly at first, the hitchhiker will begin to giggle, of all things. And then his laughter will rise into maniacal cackling. Most drivers will instantly become unnerved and pull over demanding that he get out. And he does, sort of. He simply looks at them with his soulless dark eyes and vanishes. In some cases, the driver doesn't even pull over, and the creepy apparition simply disappears out of the back seat. So 
It's a creepy version of the hitchhiker legend, you know, whether you believe it or not. Well, you ever been driving down, you know, dark road at night? You don't want to look in your rearview mirror because you might not know what's going to pop up in your back seat. Well, I haven't worried about that in years, but now that you've mentioned it, thank you. I probably will. You should try that out next time you're out <laughs> at night when I'm not with you. Thanks. Just peer into the back seat. If the urban legend doesn't convince you, there are more documented and proven ghosts in the area. For example, the abandoned Totten State Hospital, for instance. Opened in 1854, it was originally called the Taunton Lunatic Asylum, taking in all manner of people, from the truly mentally ill to the destitute. It eventually grew to be 40 buildings, including staff dorms, a chapel, a bakery, a theater, and a separate laundry. The original buildings were gorgeously gothic, with circular balconies and breezeways. But it was an asylum, which we all know means that Patients were subjected to all of the horrendous treatments used by most psychiatric hospitals of that time. You know, the lobotomies and the ice water baths. Yeah, it's pretty sickening. I do love the architecture. I just don't like what happened within those walls. Right. In 1936, Governor James Curley visited the compound and said, quote, Some wards I visited were horrible places to put animals in let alone human beings. It has been known for one nightgown to be swapped among three persons during the 24 hours, end quote. And to think of it, it wasn't that long ago. It's hard to fathom. No, because the main part of the hospital didn't even shut down until 1975, which is my lifetime right. and your lifetime. And it was pretty much abandoned and it's fallen into ruin now. But people soon began seeing some unnerving things. Allegedly, there is an elderly man who is often seen walking in the grass around the buildings while banging and screaming and moaning can be heard in the woods just at the property's edge. Hmm. Hazy images of people, like another elderly man, are often seen on the third floor of the Goss building, shimmering in and out of sight. It doesn't help that people have broken into the basement to draw cult and satanic symbols on the walls, creating legends that it was the hospital staff themselves who were practicing occult rituals. Yeah, that didn't happen. No. And I, I always feel bad when we talk about state hospitals or we see them on TV because we know people suffered there. Yeah. And I just hope that when curious people go to investigate these places that they're being respectful and that they have empathy for what the people went through. You would hope so. On the lighter side of ghostly activity, there seems to be some that takes place at the Hornbine School, which is an adorable little one-room schoolhouse that operated from 1862 until 1937. It's just this, it's the cutest little building. It's painted white, and it just looks like the quintessential one-room schoolhouse. Hmm. But when you see it online, I mean, it's tiny. And at one point, there were 49 students in this one tiny little building. Residents who currently live by the school have claimed that when the school, which is now a museum, is shut down for the day, they still hear voices coming from inside, as if lessons are still going on. Some have even sworn to see movement inside the building. And when they get a closer look, it's clearly a teacher and students dressed like it's still the 1800s. At recess, some of the children's spirits have been witnessed playing in the grass next to the school. Oh, that'd be a sight to see. We had a little one-room schoolhouse just down from our house. Mm -hmm. It was so cute. And tiny. I mean, so hard to imagine how many kids they could get right. into one of those. Yeah. So that's just three of the known haunted places in the Triangle. And there are hundreds more, including cemeteries and businesses and private residences. I mean, we could spend an hour or two just talking about the hauntings that go on there. But to be fair, even if all of the stuff that I mentioned is just misidentified animals and imaginations running wild, it's still pretty interesting to me that 
the Bridgewater Triangle area, which is huge, has had so many different and strange things being reported for like 300 years. So many believe that all of the paranormal activity ties back to the history that the native tribes were forced off their land and their myths and legends have come alive to mess with future inhabitants. Or their myths and legends were based in a reality that we just don't fully understand. And what has always been there will continue to be there. Hey, did you know? Some of our favorite boxed food and beverages really were named after actual people. Duncan Hines, Captain Morgan, Chef Boyardee, Oscar Mayer, Marie Callender, Sara Lee, Ghirardelli, and Guinness, to name a few. But some are not. Dr. Pepper, for example, although I doubt anyone falls for that one. But what about Francesco Rinaldi, Lorna Dune, Juan Valdez, and Betty Crocker? They're entirely fake and the creation of advertising geniuses. Who'd have thunk it? So what are you talking about tonight? So I came across this interesting little article that I originally thought we could use as one of our Huda Thunkets, but then I started looking a little deeper into it, and well, I may have a brand new contender for one of the worst jobs in history. Is it a Pukwudgie trainer? <laughs> no. <laughs> a Pukwudgie herder? <laughs> Let's not talk about the Pukwudgie. <laughs> so what is it? It's the groom of the stool. That sounds intriguing. So the original article I found said that in July 1184, 60 to 100 nobles met in Germany at St. Peter's Church to try and settle some pretty nasty political disputes that were going on. Now, unfortunately, with that amount of people that were gathered inside the church, the floor just couldn't handle the weight of the people. And it gave way plunging the nobles down into the open latrine that was in the basement. Oh. All but three of the nobles died, but there weren't any records that indicated whether they died from the impact or whether they drowned in the cesspit below. Oh, gosh. Now, I'm assuming it was from the fall, but I'm sure some of these nobles who had happened to be the first to go in were probably crushed by the weight of the other nobles falling on top of them. And I'm sure some of them did drown in the cesspit that were at the bottom. Right. Oh. So either way, it, it had to be a pretty disgusting way to go. So this kind of got me thinking about medieval nobles in their bathroom situations. <laughs> As it should. And then I thought about the infamous scene in Game of Thrones when Tyrion killed his father when he was on the crapper. And it kind of all rolled downhill from there. <laughs> Literally, because, you know, shit rolls downhill. <laughs> right. So in one of our past episodes, we talked about the Sin Eater, and I talked about the Plague Doctor also. I thought that could have been the worst job in history, but perhaps the worst job in history just might be the groom of the stool. Or then again, on the other hand, maybe it really wasn't that crappy after all. <laughs> I'll leave it up to all you wanderers to decide for yourselves. So the first mention of the groom of the stool dates back as far as the mid-1400s with a little poem that was written to help new grooms understand their jobs. It goes a little something like this. See the privy house for easement be fair, sweet and clean, and that the boards thereupon be covered with cloth fair and green, and the whole himself look there no board be seen. Thereon a fair cushion, the odor no man to vex. Look, there be blanket, cotton or linen to wipe the nether end. And ever he calls, wait ready and prompt, basin and ewer, and on the shoulder a towel. <laughs> That's quite the poem. Yeah, not a poem I've ever heard before, but I guess for back in its time, it pretty much makes its point. It never really caught on as a nursery rhyme, though. No. <laughs> 
From what I found in my research, it was King Henry VIII who really liked his bowel movements to be attended to with some gusto. And when we say groom of the stool, the stool being referred to isn't the actual, well, poop of the king, but the chamber pot. Generally, it was a box made of the finest timber with a hole in the top. It would be draped in velvet, which I think would be kind of hard to clean. But anyways, he probably didn't care because he wasn't the one who would have to clean it. Right. Inside the wooden chamber box would be a pewter chamber pot. The groom of the stool was responsible for carrying this chamber box or stool from palace to palace and then room to room in case this king needed to go while they were on the go. <laughs> like a party potty exactly but much more grand but <laughs> <laughs> yep. i can't imagine my job is to carry the porta potty around the castle for the king well but... somebody had to do it he also had to carry water towels and a wash bowl his first duty was to help the king undress which was a big deal since they wore a lot of layers his second duty was to make note of the king's bodily reaction to a specific food he had eaten and to keep track of his diet so he could report it to the king's physician. He would demand privacy for the king as the whole process was unfurling, and he would then help the king get dressed again. Now, there's some debate as whether or not the groom of the stool actually had to wipe the king's butt. I guess it can be assumed that it was quite possible in some instances, but I couldn't find any information as to that. <laughs> Again, <laughs> the best search engine <laughs> or the best searches on her laptop. <laughs> yeah. There have been 49 recorded grooms of the stool tending to the English king between 1524 and, wait for it, 1901. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Prince Edward was the last monarch to have an official groom of the stool as recently as 1901. Wow. Mad King George must have really had some stomach issues. He employed nine grooms of the stool during his reign. But there was one year, um, 1722 to 1723, when the position was vacant. So not really sure what was going on there. I couldn't find anything in my research as to why. But if you look over the list, something becomes immediately apparent. All the grooms of the stool were noblemen themselves. Second Earl of this, first Earl of that, which seems odd since you wouldn't expect a nobleman to tend to the bathroom needs of a king. No, you would expect it to be a servant. Exactly. But that's exactly what happened, and it was done for good reason. Bathroom time is private, or at least it should be, and it was back then, too. So who better to have prolonged private moments with the king than other high-ranking noblemen? War secrets could be shared. Political movements <laughs> could be discussed. Treaties could be debated. It was a major political position, to be honest. So men who filled the position actually coveted it because it included other privileges, besides just recording a king's bowel movements. The groom of the stool was often given keys to the king's private bedchamber. Well, that makes sense. In Sir Anthony Denny's case, for example, he held a gold key tied with a blue lace ribbon for Henry VIII's private quarters. Denny became privy <laughs> to all kinds of things about Anne of Cleves, and he knew how the king himself felt about her way before their marriage was ever annulled. He was also given permission to use Henry's official stamp, so he ended up with way more political power than you'd initially expect. Some of Henry's grooms also ended up as his treasurer, so they had power over money too. But it could also get you killed, especially if you were seen as sympathetic towards any of Henry's other wives. One groom, Henry Norris, was beheaded just like Henry's wife, Anne Bolin. And grooms of the stool were also feared. They held the king's ear, not rear, <laughs> and could persuade him or guide him or insinuate all kinds of things that could get other people 
excommunicated or killed. Queens also had grooms of the stool, although they weren't called that. They were referred to as Lady of the Bedchamber, but their roles were essentially the same. Is that why women always go to the bathroom together, Beth? <laughs> well, we we do use that time to talk about whatever guy we're with. So, in a way, yeah, kind of. Eventually, the title Groom of the Stool became Groom of the Stool. And the job centered more around dressing and undressing the king, being in charge of the royal garments, that sort of thing. Gotcha. That's very clever. So what about the last groom of the stool? James Hamilton, second Duke of Abercorn, served as Lord of the Bedchamber to the Prince of Wales from 1866 to 1885. Then in 1886, he became groom of the stool until 1891. Hmm. He was incredibly powerful, taking on prestigious political roles for his entire life, including roles in Parliament and High Sheriff. He was also elected Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Ireland, the Freemasons as well. So depending how you look at it, what sounds like a really crappy position might have been anything but... Well, there was some but. butt there, but not that butt. <laughs> you know, as you were talking about it, I was thinking that anyone who's ever had to change baby's diapers for an extended period of time basically had the same job. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, now that you say that, that kind of does make sense. <laughs> Well, as always, you can check out our sources in our show notes for more information. Ooh, you remembered to say it this time. Yes, I did, because I know sometimes you forget, or we just we just forget about it. At least one of us remembered this time. But they're always there, whether we mention it or not. If you look down in our show notes, all our sources are there. So with that said, hope you all enjoyed the episode, and we'll see you all next week. See you soon. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to traveling with you again to the places where our minds wander. If you like what you heard, please take a moment and provide us with a five-star rating and a comment on your favorite listening platform. It really helps us move up the list and become more visible on the podcast charts so new people can find us. Thank you all for your continued support. See you all next week for an all-new episode of Where Our Minds Wander.